Hello and welcome to another out of spec reviews video, except it's not. This is the Kyle Connor YouTube channel and that is a real time mess up. But you join me with the BMW M5 Touring, which is actually coming to the US. Uh, the M5 is maybe one of the most iconic and special vehicles to me personally. I've been a M5 enthusiast my entire life. Uh, my dad actually had an E60 M5 with the V10 screaming. And I remember really fun days of turning traction control off in that car and making him freak out on on-ramps thinking he was gonna stuff it into a wall. Just M5 truly is pinnacle car. It has been peak car to me. Uh, all the way from the E39 generation, which every car enthusiast loves, of course, and even to the modern ones uh, with the twin turbo V8s and the modern cars. I've had them on track. I've had them on road trips, and it is so important. So now the M5, of course, with the sedan has gained some electrification, which fits in with my work on out of spec. Of course, I test and review primarily electric cars and plug-in hybrids, which this now falls into the category of. And so it's really important to me that BMW gets this right because I will be personally upset if it doesn't drive very well. It's so important that the tuning of the electric motor inside of the transmission works really well with the rest of the drive line. Beyond that, even more important to me, I love wagons. And this is now the third ever m5 touring m5 wagon and it is coming to our market for the first time so i'm pretty excited overall and in this video i'm going to take you on a full tour of the m5 touring we also have the sedan inside as well and uh, my friend john kelly who's responsible from the u.s side for five series at the moment he is an awesome car enthusiast ev guy as well really love john i'm so glad he's able to join us for this video so we're going to do uh some chat with him about the u.s market the pricing some options why things are what they are the weight of the car we're going to talk to him about as well because that's been the number one comment and i've even been making fun of it like this weighs more than the moon but john assures us it's going to drive very well and the weight's in the right spot and there's other things that go into it beyond just the number so join us as we go on a full deep dive tour hopefully the nerdiest video on the internet of the new m5 and m5 touring welcome to the new m5 of the g90 generation this is the key with the m colors right in here of course very typical of the new bmw style and we have some other things that are even more exciting than the key which is what this key unlocks here of course the m5 touring featured in isle of man green with actually the orange interior which is really cool quite exciting as well i can open the door just to show you inside briefly now what has been known has been the M5 sedan up to this point. Now, of course, launching is the Touring, and this was the global premiere. Actually, my friend Colton and I were able to go to the premiere, which was amazing, where they had every generation of M5 coming across the ramp, which was just amazing. And, uh, and then, of course, it ended with this particular vehicle right here. And I'm so happy that we are getting the Touring in with our market. More shoulder plans, track suits, and Nike Air Maxes for the very first time. And there was hair. A lot of hair. No better time then to launch the first ever M5, the E28, and on to a top speed of 147 miles an hour. Now, few cars cause enthusiast finds to tingle like this one. For many fans of the mark, the third generation brought together the very best of what makes Uh, I want to start with how this car is laid out from a powertrain perspective, some chassis topics, and then we'll move on to the interior and software. So the first thing I'm going to do is open up the hood for you guys, which can be had right in here. So it's a double pull, typical BMW. And what this will reveal to you is a twin power turbo in BMW speak, but basically a twin turbo V8 4.4 liter of the newest generation. There's some new Valtronic stuff going on. And the integration between this power plant with the electric system is what matters to me so much. I'm very particular on hybrid powertrains, hybrid tuning, and BMW's done a really good job with their plug-in hybrids up until the XM. The XM was really clunky, not great, and that has me worried personally because the XM 
and this share a very similar drivetrain. Now I've been told and assured that the tuning has been updated, some smoothness has been added in and it'll be good. But just to roughly walk you, in, walk you through the over 700 horsepower combined system output, I'll walk you through how this is laid out. So you have your combustion engine right here on the output shaft, basically in the bell has housing of the transmission is a permanent magnet electric motor. It's 145 kilowatts, 198 horsepower, leading then into an eight speed transmission, which then goes to a transfer case, which can split the power uh, you know, between both axles basically indefinitely. And you can go up to 100% of the power to the rear axle in a two wheel drive mode, which is awesome. I'm really curious to see if they allow us to do drifting in electric mode <laughs> with rear drive could be interesting. I mean, 200 horsepower is enough, at least on a loose surface to probably swing it around. We'll play around with that when we drive the car and see what's possible. There are some benefits, of course, of putting a electric motor between the engine and the transmission. The first is you get basically eight different gear ratios that you can run that electric motor through. So it can basically on the highway be spinning in a more efficient range. So you actually get a little bit more range and then you get a bunch of torque off the line. The downside of doing it with this arrangement is some of the smoothness. You will feel some shifting. You will feel maybe not this single pedal drive that you get with an electric motor. For example, Volvo just, you know, there's a plenty of others that do this with their plug-in hybrids. They put a direct electric motor on the rear axle that acts basically as an EV driving experience. This will not be that. It's not uncommon for BMW, but it's all about the tuning. Feeding that permanent magnet electric motor is this is a Euro spec car, but again, the US spec cars are around uh, and there's really not many differences on board charger just for three phase versus single phase. You'll have an orange marker in the US car here as well. Uh, feeding that is a roughly 15 kilowatt hour usable battery. What's interesting though is in Europe, they get about an 18 kilowatt hour usable battery. I'm not sure what homologation went into us getting a little bit less usable capacity or it could actually be just the way that they rate the batteries. We have different cycles that the batteries have to go through to judge usable capacity. And I don't have the answer whether or not it's a different buffer or a different test in terms of capacity. It should be around 25-ish miles in the EPA cycle on electric mode. However, in Europe, it will be uh, roughly 40 miles. They say like 38 to 42 miles WLTP electric range. In my experience with BMWs, when you're driving them pure electric, they always go a bit farther than what they say. Now, of course, we're talking about an M5 and doing daily driving electric. Why does that matter? M5s really need to be the one vehicle that do everything. And from my perspective, as someone who is a prospective buyer of a car like this, because I love electric V8s, wagons, it's like got all of the greatest highlights right here. Uh, I want to be able to drive electric every day, plug in at home, juice up. And one of the best parts is the M5 Touring will come as standard from launch with an 11 kilowatt onboard charger. For the non-nerds out there, you're like, what the heck are you talking about, Kyle? It just means you'll be able to, in a couple hours, basically go zero to full in the electric battery. So you can run your morning errands, come back home, get some work done, go pick up your kids from school, do whatever you have to do, and you'll always have energy in the battery to drive electric. To me, that is so important. Uh, on top of that, you'll also be able to target a charge of the hybrid battery from the combustion engine. Why would you ever do that? Ahead of a track day drag race, when you wanna go rip in the canyons, you want as much energy in the battery pack system, the 15 kilowatt hour usable battery, so you can deploy that as a boost function. So it's gonna be really cool when we drive it. It's gonna be a super fun video where we can talk about how the electric motor interplays with the combustion engine. I imagine many of the tunings will be similar to the XM that we've already experienced, just needs to be more refined. That's powertrain aside. We've gotten through all that. Can I just show everyone the storage space? That's enough. That's really similar between sedan and touring. But if we come back here, this is why you buy the M5 touring. Holy smokes. It's my first time seeing the storage space. Dude, this is huge in here. What the heck? We also have some underfloor storage. And of course you have your battery pack under here as well. This is a pre-series car, so it's not final production, but we have to drop the seats oh my goodness i could fit all three of my dogs in here and i have some big ass dogs the height maybe not as much as an suv but oh this is so cool and you could put all your dogs in here and do almost 200 miles an hour when you spec the m drivers pack which is amazing not that i recommend you do that on the public road of course but you can so pre-series car things happening here let's take a look back here this one finished in like i mentioned isle of man green with the orange interior 
the details, the build quality, it's all typical 5 Series. We all know I'm a big fan of the new 5 Series. I've reviewed the new i5, which is actually similar, same rough chassis as this car. This, of course, stiff and different bolstering, slightly different body and white, of course. And I just think the 5 Series is the size of car that can do it all. It's a business class sedan. It's comfortable on the long cruise, but also not as big as a 7 Series and wallowiness. I'm going to try the back seat room here, of course, in the new M5. Oh my gosh, dude, you sink into these seats so cool one thing i noticed was when the seats were down they were at a pretty low angle which had me worried about bolstering but the seats give way when i sit in here so i actually do have quite a bit of bolstering and there's a center little armrest i can put down so when you're doing hot laps it'll hold you in two usb-c ports back here there's a screen with climate controls that just went off because the timing went off another usb-c port here for like an accessory for an ipad or something and there's even a little detent attention to detail bmw where this slot will hold itself right there. So you just get the port, but not the empty blank, which is awesome. This one's equipped with the Bowers & Wilkins big boy sound system. To be honest, I don't know if that will be standard or optional equipment in the US. Uh, John will know when we talk to him, but sound systems gotta be good in this car. I mean, I think it's just one of those things that has to do everything right. Um, jumping now in the driver's seat for the first time, the door feels big and heavy and chunky and just very high quality. Now the M5, just so everyone remembers, is not meant to be a track dedicated machine. You can go M3 CS, M4 CSL, if you wanna go crazy. This thing is meant to be daily driver, Autobahn blaster, but then also have some fun in the corners and it needs to be able to do a track day. I'm not saying it doesn't. So it's got a red start stop button in here, Colton, if you take a look. You got a really nice steering wheel finished in a very smooth grain leather feels very nice in comparison to the standard cars it's got your m1 and m2 buttons which in my opinion are too big that's a little gaudy a little showy i don't know if i like the red stripe i like an m5 to be totally understated i miss the days of just when you had no idea it was an m car it's just it was supposed to be you know normal looking car but with like a dragon under the hood this still has an air of that character, but they put M badges and red things around and okay, we've got a little bit showy. Typical with new 5 Series, like I've done in my new 5 Series reviews, you have the basic vent controls down here, this sort of crystal situation. I mean, it's the same iDrive system that we've done many times now on this channel, or mostly out of spec reviews where we've done i5 and i7. It's that new infotainment, iDrive 8 point whatever this one's on. We'll look in the other one there. Head up display, huge glass roof, I have to say. That's really impressive. Now, I actually like a glass roof. I like a sunroof as well, but sunroofs typically don't get the expansive space that glass roofs do. So this car feels absolutely massive inside in terms of just this cavernous space. And really, from a driving perspective, I really hope people go for this over the sedan. So the interior, the sills are a little bit wider than the standard car, but it all feels very 5 Series, just with like the top spec options. And the cars come pretty much fully loaded for our market, which is pretty cool. So you get Merino leather as standard, which is so important to me in BMWs because I don't like their uh, textured materials. This fine grain leather is just amazing. You can option ventilated seats and head up display and all these other things. But the package seems right. It's 120 ish thousand dollars starting. Seems not bad, just, you know, for a car that can do 200 miles an hour with your entire family and dogs and all wheel drive for skiing and put a roof box on it. Like it's the one thing that can do it all. So what I'd love to do is talk to my friend, John Kelly, who is again, responsible for the product here in the US. We're gonna just run through a bunch of questions, little chat, you'll love him. He's awesome, real hardcore car enthusiast. Then after that, we're gonna go through the software in the car and just see if there's any M specific things. I wanna look at all the drive modes and talk about, okay, maybe there's charge limits on the battery. We'll look at all the nerd stuff. And then we'll wrap up the video. But overall, the back seat room is incredible. The front seat is nice and expansive. The trunk space, holy smokes, you can literally put anything you want in here and it looks amazing. So I think this car is a winner. I'm sure you will all agree with me. Uh, so yeah, let's do that. Let's talk to John. I think you guys will enjoy it. Well, John, welcome to the channel. 
Thanks for having me, Kyle. Thank you so much. We've had a lot of conversations over the years, and actually you were with me when I got to see the M5 sedan for the first time. That's right. And that was in South Carolina. It was like the secret room, and okay. you're like, all right, check this thing out. And I was like, holy smokes, it looks amazing. <laughs> and you know, for our audience who don't know you, you're responsible for the 5 Series in our market, along with other models. That's right. And um, you know, I just think, first of all, so cool that you got us the M5 Touring. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're super excited about it. I mean, it's the first time we've had the M5 Touring in the US. It marks the return of the Touring for BMW in the US. Um, there actually have, if you weren't aware, there were two other BMW M5 Tourings globally in the past, second and fourth generation, but they didn't come to the US. This is the first time. And uh, we just unveiled it here at, at Pebble Beach. We had the world premiere a couple of days ago and the response has been fantastic. Yeah, I was lucky enough to attend the world premiere and it was just an amazing presentation of all the history of M5. You drove the E39 That's up right. and over, which was <laughs> so cool. One of my dream cars. I love that every enthusiast loves an E39 it's, M5. It's one of my favorites. I actually just sold mine a little while oh, ago. Oh, no way, okay. Uh, well, sad that you <laughs> sold it, but at least you got to drive the, the Heritage car. Yeah. So that was cool. It was a really nice one. Um, when we saw the M5 <laughs> sedan, which actually, Colton, why don't we run inside really quick? John, I'd love for you to just briefly walk us through the highlights of this car, M5 has always been really important to me personally, but also BMW as a brand. Mm -hmm. um, this car has some crazy figures, 700 plus horsepower. The first time mm -hmm. you've had electric systems involved and you're really an EV guy as well. You drive an i5, so you're with the EV stuff for our audience who doesn't know. It's actually pretty rare to find like company executives or people that are into it that drive electric. So I'm really glad you're super into the nerd stuff. I am. Yeah. Okay. I do consider myself a bit of a car nerd. Um, I do have an engineering background. I love, I love getting into the nitty gritty, the details. Um, I love the electric cars, also the plug-in hybrids where you really can get the best of both, both worlds in a lot of senses, especially with this car, you mentioned over 700 horsepower. And that's, that's possible because we have the 4.4 liter twin turbo V8. And then we have the electric motor. The electric motor alone makes a little under 200 horsepower. Yeah, it's like so, 145 kilowatts or something. Yeah, I think, I think it's yeah. 194 horsepower. Okay, power, yeah, mistaken. yeah. Um, so I love that you get the best of both worlds. Um, but one thing that's, that's really important about this car for the US is, I mean, this is the seventh generation of the M5. So there's a heritage, right? We have to make sure every generation gets better and better. And this car is no exception, right? The car, it's the most dynamic M5 ever. It's a fantastic, I've been driving the car uh, here, and on, here and now for uh, two weeks or so, and I, I'm, I'm blown away by it. It's so fantastic. But also the US is the biggest market for the M5. So we need to make sure that it's the right car for the U.S. market and will appeal to the U.S. audience, in particular the U.S. enthusiast. But at the same time, as an M5, it's not a pure track weapon, for example. Sure. Right. It's a car that you need to be able to cruise around, go long distance, be comfortable. Ride quality is outstanding. But when you want to drive it dynamically, you want to take it to a racetrack, it's fully capable as well. And the car really balances that extremely well. Um, and it, it, the car has uh, MX drive as well. So. Uh, the V8 engine, the electric motor, which is in the uh, the bell housing of the transmission, the 8HP transmission, all-wheel drive. But if you want, you can put it in two-wheel drive right, mode. Right, which is amazing. All 700 you, horse to the rear axle. And it's, it's you can do it quickly. So like if you have the drive mode screen up, you can be like, oh, corner two-wheel drive. <laughs> and then back to MX drive or, you know, sport mode. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with the previous generation. And of course, M3 is with a similar system. Mm -hmm. This has upgraded transfer case, everything to handle all the extra power. Right. Um, from a powertrain perspective, I have, you know, almost no concerns about the performance in a straight line. I mean, it's mm -hmm. mid three seconds, zero to 60. The car is going to be a rocket ship. And it's not just about zero to 60. M5 has always been about like 100 to 150 is yep. just like insane weapons. I think a lot of our audience, I've seen comments online about the weight of the car mm -hmm. being quite heavy. Now, I'm used to driving electric cars and I know you are as well. So the weight yeah. may be not as much of a concern to me initially because I know you can do some magic to hide the weight. What would you say to those comments regarding the weight of the car? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, you got to drive it. When you drive it, it's, I mean, the driving is believing. The car, it's fantastic, and it really is the most dynamic M5 ever. And of course, it has a hybrid drivetrain. So you have a high voltage battery, they add some weight. You have the electric motor, that adds some weight. The car is physically larger than its predecessor. So of course, a little bit more. Uh, there's some additional uh, bracing to, to reinforce the chassis and so forth. But at the end of the day, the battery is mounted under the floor pan, just like in the electric cars that you and I always talk about. Yep. The battery is mounted so low that the center of gravity is pulled down so low that you don't feel it in the same way. 
Um, there have also been a few other things, um, the car BMWs in general. We always focus, especially the high-performance cars, on low unsprung mass. There's so much you can do by having aluminum-intensive suspension, forged wheels that are lighter weight, and so forth and so on, even carbon ceramic brakes because they're moving with the car. All of this low unsprung mass leads to a more agile, more nimble feel. And very importantly, this is one of the things I absolutely love about this car is for the first time ever on an M5, we have rear axle steering. So yeah. integral active steering. But what's great about it is you don't feel it. You feel the benefits of it, but you don't feel the rear axle turning. So it's not like simulated this weird over like 10 degree craziness that some it, cars have. It's only one and a half degrees. Oh, perfect. Right? So it's yeah. really not much, but it's enough to make the impact that you want. So at low speeds, helps your turning circle be tighter. At high speeds, they move in the same direction, so more high speed stability. But very importantly also, it can help to adjust and correct for understeer and oversteer to help oh, the car feel more neutral. That's cool. And as a result, the car feels more nimble, more agile, and just to be honest, more fun to drive. Well, that sounds pretty exciting from like a stability perspective on track. The one character M5s always had, and I recently was just at the Performance Center with you and I got to drive uh, the previous M5 CS around, which oh, was yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, and that car was, was just a drift monster if you want it to be, but also very, very tactile and like mm -hmm. did exactly what I wanted considering the size of that vehicle was large. Um, does the rear steer, is it tuned to like not get in your way if you want to drift it? Can it basically just go straight? Uh, that's an excellent question. So I'm honestly not sure. When you put it in two-wheel drive mode, which is what you would want to do then, yeah. I'm not sure if it's deactivated or not, but I don't think you would have too much of an impact if you're in two-wheel drive with over 700 horsepower <laughs> yeah, just and, you want, <laughs> and you want to rotate the car. Yeah. I don't think it's going to interfere. Okay, I like it. That's cool. I cannot wait, of course, to drive this, of course, for the first time, do all the stuff that this car needs to do. Mm -hmm. M5 has to be one of those vehicles that literally does everything. It has to be exactly. comfortable in the daily drive. It needs to be dynamic enough to do a track day. Like, no question, mm -hmm. M5s have to be able to go around but you need the comfort daily you need you know the starbucks run the long distance yeah. if you're going from jersey to vermont or whatever like it's got to be able to put the miles on so we know this car we've had the chance to look at it i think our audience is familiar with m5 sedan at this point looks amazing honestly it's wide it looks crazy when compared to the standard 5 series what's cool about the 5 series maybe our audience doesn't know this but um the car is adapted to be anything from a pure combustion vehicle to a pure electric vehicle and mm -hmm. anything in between so the actual floor pan where the hybrid battery sits is very similar to where the battery electric you know yep. the battery fits in the i5 so the chassis has been developed for all these different powertrains from launch which is really cool it's, it's a very flexible architecture, allows for full combustion, um, full BEV, plug-in hybrid. We have four-cylinder, six-cylinder, eight-cylinder. I mean, it's, it's a very flexible chassis. And it's also one of the things you just mentioned, how, how wide the car was and how great it looks. This is also the first ever full wide-body M5. So it's significantly wider than the standard 5 Series, about three inches up front in terms of additional width, about two inches in the rear. Right. So you especially see that at certain angles where you see, exactly, for example, from the rear door into the rear quarter, yeah. it steps out so aggressively so beefy. and just looks really just bold. And, and even just like standing right behind the car, like when you're following one, it's just going to be like, holy smokes, this thing's got some muscle. Yeah. All right. So we know this car pretty well. I love that you have it plugged in, by the way, to show some of the electric bits. Yep. Uh, this is what we're really here to talk about, which is the new M5 Touring. And this week was the global unveil of this car. Yep. There was, we, we kind of had a feeling seeing prototypes going around that there was going to be an M5 Touring. Mm -hmm. We didn't know if it was going to come to the US. And so you can confirm this is US bound for sure. Absolutely. The car is coming to the US. Uh, we're extremely excited about it. I've been working on, on this car for the last few years and, and I couldn't wait for this day to be able to announce it's coming to the US. We've had so many customers asking for the car. Um, the, the, the press has been all over this, very excited about it. Um, it really gives you all the benefits because the drivetrain is, of course, identical to the sedan that we just talked about. So you have all the benefits of an M5, the comfortable daily driver, long distance cruiser that you can take straight to the racetrack, take the car seats out and go out on the track. Yeah. I mean, it does all that with additional versatility. Right? Yeah, now you, you can the put the dogs on the back. Now you can put the dogs <laughs> in the back. You can fold the rear seats down and have a tremendous amount of space back there. Yeah. Um, and actually, one, one thing that, that keeps coming up is the overall size of the car. And there's a perception because of the long roof right. that the car is longer. Sure. And it looks like it has slightly different proportions, but in reality, it's identical. Right. It's so exactly. same wheelbase, same yep. length of the vehicle, yep. maybe obviously taller back here. 
but the oh, width yeah, is the same. Here. Yeah, the width is identical, and even the maximum height is only off by I think three or four millimeters, just because <laughs> wow. this car has roof rails. <laughs> okay, that's yeah. amazing. Which is also great yeah. for the versatility of the car. Put some crossbars on it. Hell put yeah. a ski box on, or what have you. Dude, I just can't wait to see these things like tearing up Colorado, <laughs> put the skis on the top and just bop, 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 everywhere. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, so absolutely. M5 Touring, this truly is the one car that can do it all now. You have all wheel drive, which is, I think, really important for our local market in Colorado. Of course, Northeast as well loves mm -hmm. all wheel drive, love the ability to go two wheel drive. But can we talk for a minute beyond just the power distribution, the electric stuff, the hybrid systems? Mm -hmm. So one thing, and I don't know if I've ever talked to you about this before, but when I drove the XM quite a bit, you have the electric motor pre-transmission. And mm -hmm. in like X5, 45E or 50E, it's really smooth and you know, the, it's not the M Steptronic transmission. With XM, it obviously it's a much beefier transmission and you do feel it shift a little bit in electric mode you've had the chance now to drive the standard m5 around is it pretty smooth in ev mode does it does it do a pretty good job it's extremely smooth but as you mentioned the the electric motor is in the bell housing so it's pre-transmission so the electric motor drives through each of the gears in the transmission so it does change gears and you can feel it, but it's almost imperceptible. So it's not like a, a traditional electric vehicle with a single speed gearbox where it, it just goes. Sure. Right. This does go through the gears, but it's so smooth. It's, it's almost imperceptible. And I think there's always a trade off there from a performance and drivability standpoint. The cool thing with BMWs that you do it this way is for whatever reason, when you EPA range, you know, give a quoted range, you always exceed it in electric mode. Mm -hmm. So like you can match if it says, you know, 30 miles electric, that's like 30 miles at 75 miles an hour cruising because that electric motor is spinning in the rev range that it's happy with. And very few automakers do it this way. More are starting to, especially mm -hmm. the Germans. But I think that alone is worth the trade off of feeling a little bit of shifting in electric mode. What's your impression? Yeah, I would agree. Um, and the, the car will be rated at around 25 miles EPA. We don't have final numbers yet. This is preliminary. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, it's a solid range for a daily commute. I mean, personally, with my commute, I can go to work, you know, go back, pick up the kids from practice, go home, and I can do my whole commute electric because I like driving electric during the day. But then when you want to, you know, take it out onto a windy road and enjoy the sound of the twin turbo V8, you can. Um, but more yeah, importantly, but more, charging it. So yep. you can charge it two ways. One from the combustion engine, and I believe the battery will charge up quicker from the combustion engine based off drive mode. So if you deplete mm -hmm. the battery and go like Sport Plus, it'll do like a rapid charge situation or it'll get up there. I don't know exactly what the target percentage is, um, but you can also plug it into a wall box or a right. NEMA 1450 or whatever. But really cool is that you will have an 11 kilowatt onboard charger right. in this thing. Yeah, so from launch in November, so actually speaking of timing, the car goes into production this November mm -hmm. and then it's a rolling launch. So the cars will start showing up at retailers probably about January. Um, and all of those cars will be equipped with an 11 kilowatt onboard charger. So yeah, you can charge it at home at 11 kilowatts. The battery, the, the usable energy is roughly 15 kilowatt hours. So charges pretty darn quick. Yeah. Um, and will there be a charge limit? Because like a lot of your plug-in hybrids do allow you to not go 100%. You can right. set it like 90 or 80, which is for a nerd perspective. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, so you can change the charge rate. Okay. Right. How many amps you're putting in. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you can change the I'm going to dig SO. around let's, and let's see if I can check, uh, find it. One. So yeah. one last question from the U.S. market, pricing, packages. How yeah. would you recommend people to option theirs? Obviously, people watching this are going to order one. Yeah. I'm yeah. considering ordering one because it's kind of the perfect car for what I need to do. Um, yeah. How would you recommend people spec it? What do you have? Um, so for one, I can't wait to have one myself. And, um, and I would spec it very simply in the sense that the car is very easy to spec, but we don't, you know, car comes very well equipped uh, in its base form with, you know, 18 way merino leather seats and the, the M steering wheel. And I mean, you name it, it has just about everything. The sky roof, the full glass roof with shade. That's, that's all standard, standard in our market. Yeah, nice. so the car comes extremely well equipped. Um, but what's really important for car, for customers in this segment, M5 customers at this price point, because the, the touring will start at 121, 500. So at this price point, we want to make sure that you can have enough variability. You can tailor the car to your liking. So we have 10 standard paints available. So that's, that's great. But then there's also a, about 150 special order paints, <laughs> almost anything under the rainbow. Yeah. Um, so you can get the paint color you want, the upholsteries. So this was a big departure from what we've had previously on the M5. Now we have 
We have four different upholsteries at launch, two more coming in, uh, in the spring, but we have bold colors. We have your traditional black, we have Silverstone, you know, very, yep. very typical M5. But then we have Kailami Orange we have here. Yeah, which is so cool. And this spec, you know, this green, we were talking, Isle of Man hasn't been my personal favorite, but all my friends love it. Yeah. And I know you love it as I well. I'm, I'm a, yeah, I'm a car nerd and I'm a green car nerd <laughs> yeah, as well. Sure. And a touring nerd. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but then you've got this crazy orange interior, which looks perfect against it. it it's really great. cool. And then we also have red. That's nice, nice and bold. And then in the spring, we have uh, a violet coming oh, no as way. well as uh, it's called Deep Lagoon. It's like a, a dark green color. Okay. So you can really tailor it to your liking. Exterior, we have wheels, no wheel upgrades. It only comes with the maximum wheel size, which is 20 on the front axle, 21 on the rear. Two different stylings, but three different finishes. So you get to choose from three different colors, whether you want bicolor, all black. Yep. Uh, even brake calipers, four different caliper colors. So you can get them, you know, get them to match your car as well as you like. Yeah. It's uh, blue, red, black and then gold if you get the carbon ceramics as sure. the upgrade yeah so you have you're an executive package with a few options um, but you can you can have the car very well equipped for around 125 okay yeah and that's the cool thing because the worry was when you whenever a german company especially announces a base price for a car you go oh my goodness i need headlights i need wiper blades i need you know <laughs> basic necessities that are going to you know add 30 percent to the price but yeah. here i mean you're almost saying you can just get a base car and be totally fine yeah the, the car comes very well equipped in the base and uh, but of course if you want carbon ceramics if you're going to be tracking the car or whatnot that's great um, we have the m drivers package which we have on other m cars as well yeah which gives you a day at the driving school and also unleashes the maximum top speed which is 190. yeah dude almost so. 200 miles an hour in the m5 touring would be pretty amazing yeah well, sure. I can't thank you enough for taking the time. I mean, I think we'll, we have plenty more to do together. We'll hopefully be able to go when we drive the car and chat more about it and really yeah. get into the driving dynamics portions. I mean, I'm honestly nervous about how it drives because M5s have to be so good that there is no room for any compromise in something where you're spending yep. north of triple digits for a car that has so much heritage behind it with some of the most iconic vehicles. This really has to be good. It has to be totally tuned properly you have some of the best engineers on the planet. I just, I know you've driven it, I haven't, but my yeah. fingers are crossed that it's as good as you say it is. And you can see me smiling, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I've driven it and I love it. It, it is that good to drive. Um, next time we're together and, and you can drive it, we should definitely do a recap afterwards. Yes, yes, and, let's uh, do it. But yeah, the, the car is gonna be, it's gonna be fantastic. And like I said, it, it'll be at dealers. Um, the, the sedan should reach dealers in Q4 and then the touring in Q1. Amazing. Well, I can't thank you enough for taking the yeah. time, John. That was epic. Thanks. So and you know. we'll see you on the channel again. Always cool to have EV nerds and plug-in hybrid <laughs> nerds chat with us about all this stuff. Can't wait Great. to drive this thing. So thanks for joining. Great. Thank you, Kyle. Dude, we just hopped in. Colton's with me in the back seat. Thanks for filming, by the way. Um, something about getting into a 5 Series just feels so right. There is like the right width, the right depth this one has a much darker interior no glass roof it feels noticeably smaller and tighter than the touring but it's actually not dimensionally like up here it's the same but it feels so much smaller and i think it's just down to the spec that car was outside the glass roof really makes a difference this one's equipped with the carbon roof so i'm just getting set in here getting myself comfortable i want to just briefly show you some software stuff there isn't anything major but this is the newest generation of iDrive and so I can come over here to all of the different menus and to me this is a bit confusing the system is very stable very reliable I really have not had any glitches or any bugs with any modern BMW iDrive system I just don't love the individual squares I don't think this is very user friendly but I just want to go through some of the M5's driving modes driving settings so uh, driver assistance should be very similar to the standard car where you have all of the warnings and blind spot stuff and the 5 series does have the newest version of their driver assistance when you get the pro or plus or whatever it's called the top package where it will do eye chain uh, eye tracking and automatic lane changes and so it's like if you come up on a slower vehicle on adaptive cruise and you want to go for the pass you can confirm that by looking in one of the side view mirrors and then it will initiate a pass it's a really cool thing bmw's driver assistance systems um, always perform really well in our hogback testing i think they're number two or number three um in terms of their capabilities. I love doing long distance drives with BMW's driver assistance. And that's what an M5 is all about. This needs to be a mile muncher and having amazing assistance to just stay in the middle of the lane on the highway while you're cruising 
well, this has one of the best systems on the market. So that is a huge plus, way better than Audi's system, by the way. If you're thinking RS6 or M5 and you do a lot of miles, let the driver assistance alone is like enough to do it. One thing that I think is cool, this is neat, electric on start. And this is what I would do to avoid as many cold startups on the combustion engine as possible. Uh, because I also move cars around in uh, tight spaces. We have the hub, we have the house, and I'm always shifting cars. I don't necessarily want to do go, you know, have my combustion engine go through a cold start cycle over and over and over and over. So I can actually lock the car in electric mode so it remembers to stay in EV, which is really cool. So I really, really like that uh, for sure. Then we get to some of the magic of the M car. And this is where you get all of your different drive settings. And I think it's really cool. You can program two configurable settings, just traditional for BMW M1 and M2. It's been like this for a while. And um, I think it's important to go through these settings because for the nerds watching this video and for me, this is what a BMW is all about. Total configurability about how you want your car to perform. And to think about all the time it takes to tune every single individual one of these settings and feelings from e-pass tuning to your brake systems and blending in regen and friction brakes is really cool. One neat fact about this combustion engine is if you downshift, typically you would like do that to, to engine brake to slow down. Uh, this actually has basically exhaust valve adjustments now where you can through the Valvetronic system uh, it will actually make the engine uh, free run more or less so it won't build up as much uh, pressure in the combustion chamber which means the engine's actually going to not hold you back you will get almost no engine braking it's like the opposite of a jake brake why would you want that why don't you want engine braking but it's actually to let the electric motor regen more so you don't want it to fight against the combustion engine's internal resistance uh, it will actually make you know, on the overrun, it will open up the exhaust valves and then it'll slow down the car naturally, hopefully through the electric motor so it can recapture more EV stuff, more EV power, energy, so that when you go hard throttle or you're waiting for the turbos to boost up and it builds in a little bit of electric torque with that, that motor pre-transmission, uh, you have some energy to burn. So it's always gonna be walking back and forth. A concern I have is for the Germans, especially if you're really pushing, maybe even on a track day, but if you're pushing on the Autobahn top speed for a while, what happens when you run out of battery? Because I've driven a lot of plug-in hybrids on high speed. Once the battery's depleted, boom, your top speed comes down, your performance is decreased, the cooling systems of the battery pack might get hot. I ran into this a lot with Volvo plug-in hybrids like Polestar T8s and stuff where you, you're you going throttle brake, throttle brake, so much energy is coming in and out of the battery, so much power, you have so much heat loss that you hit a thermal limit and it basically shuts off the EV system. Now, I think this is where probably BMW and Porsche and other Germans who really care about these things will tune this car properly. This is something we're gonna have to test. We're gonna have to get the car, do some thermal testing, make sure that it can handle the hardcore stuff. And I really should probably get this car in Germany uh, and test a lot of those things for you guys because that's one of the very few places you can legally just you know keep it wide open for 10 minutes straight, basically. So you have drivetrain, comfort, sport, and sport plus. Uh, which is very typical. You also have different energy recovery or regen settings. So for me, I would like max, why not? I wanna recapture as much as possible off throttle. I like the feeling of one pedal driving. Your drive logic is gonna be your transmission sift, uh, not only smoothness, but speed and sort of a character of the transmission. Maybe sport is gonna be the sweet spot in, in typical sport plus fashion for BMW on those. Sometimes they kick a little hard. On track, it might be nice, but it can also unsettle the car at times. So sport might be the happy medium. We'll have to play around with that. From your adaptive damper settings, you have three settings uh, for your chassis stiffness. You have two settings for steering two settings for your braking system, comfort and sport. This one I almost have a fundamental confusion about and I need to play around with it, but a brake pedal should feel one way all the time, even in a sporty car or a comfort car. I'm not sure I like the idea of a brake pedal changing its character, but it's worth you know exploring and playing around with that. And then you have your MX drive, which is the real magic of this car. And I think the real key advantage over an Audi RS6 or something similar, where you can go four wheel drive, four wheel drive sport, which is more rear biased. And it just holds you in a little bit of slip angle before it starts to shift power a little bit more forwards. And X drive is amazing. I'm a huge X drive fan. 
and then you have the magic of two-wheel drive, which you can do on the fly at any point. Just go two-wheel drive and rip a fat skid and then bring the car back in. It's awesome. I just think it's so cool. And uh, I mean, props to BMW for really giving the enthusiasts what we want. I watch all these videos and I've driven RS6 and we have a video coming up with RS6 too, where they're just kind of understeery. Sometimes if you really get the weight moving, you can get it to move around and M5s are just like, skids all day drink a coffee i mean this car holds the world record for the longest drift was over 200 miles something like that in the previous generation m5 so just amazing and then you have m sound which i think is more than just a valve in the exhaust it will also bring in some simulated sound on the inside leave it to the tuners to go through and maybe shut some of those speakers off to me, it, it really needs to not sound synthetic. I want the purest sound in electric and I really want the V8 sound in combustion, uh, but I just don't want any synthetic feeling noises in here. Of course, there's gonna be some, but as long as it feels natural, I'll be happy and okay with that. All of your presets and favorite settings can be stored in M configuration one or two, uh, which is awesome. So, you know, that's up to you how you wanna do it. Typically, the way I drive these cars is I have at least when I had the XM for a week, I was like, okay, electric mode, didn't need a special M mode. Then I had sporty driving uh, on M1, which would be like Canyon. So like DSC half off, maybe MX drive in the sports setting, um, something like that. And then M2 would be like, let's just drift, <laughs> which is probably how I would set this car up. Um, so from a charging perspective, you get the same uh, settings as the... Um, basically the, the battery electric cars, which is pretty cool. So you can set a charging uh, time slot to charge when electricity is less expensive. Also, sometimes it's not great to have your battery electric car sitting at 100% all the time. Same with plug-in hybrids. So you may wanna choose it uh, to start charging maybe a couple hours before you leave your for your commute. That way the high voltage battery stays at lowest state of charge possible. And with a big buffer like a hybrid, they really probably wanna be around 20, 25% for long-term storage. And then, you know, before you leave, you could say, okay, start charging at 4 a.m. every day. That way, by the time you leave at five or seven or whatever you wanna go, then you'll be at 100%, but it'll sit there for a shorter period of time. Um, AC limit, this particular car that we're in, the sedan is 32 amps. The touring is gonna be 48 amps, 11 kilowatts in that. My understanding is that at some point, this car probably will get updated. I would imagine to match the touring, but the touring is confirmed to have a 48 amp, 11 kilowatt onboard charger, which is more than some battery electric vehicles. Porsche Macan Electric only has a 48 amp, or sorry, a 40 amp onboard charger. That's gonna have eight more amps on a plug-in hybrid. That's pretty sick. And uh, props to BMW for doing that because we've given them a lot of flack for their slow onboard chargers and plug-in hybrids. Now we're finally getting some juice. One of my favorite features here is that you will actually be able to set a charging target all the way down to 30%, even lower, 20%. There's a big buffer there, maybe 20, 25% for storage. So if you go on vacation, you can leave the car plugged in, keep the battery low, and then you'll be able to slide it up to 100%, uh, of course, when you want to. And I'm gonna accept and end the charging session because they had the car set to 90%. Even BMW is not full charging their cars. That's pretty cool because this is a display car. Why fry the battery? Um, Plug-in charge is cool. It actually has the uh, chip to do ISO 15118 communications. Um, we haven't really seen many AC units accepting plug-in charge yet, but this will come into the future. So the car is pre-wired. I believe it also supports multi-contract. It's probably the same chip as their battery electric cars. And you can lock some of those charging settings to a location. I think that's really the main stuff for the electric. You get some really cool gauges. So I can pull up some info here if it wants to go. Oh no, maybe this is just what it is, a little drivetrain widget that will show us our turbo boost pressure, temperature gauge of coolant and oil, and also the battery pack average temperature, which I'm really happy. It's actually maybe the first plug-in hybrid. No, I think Porsche does as well, but it's one of the first plug-in hybrids that shows you battery pack temperature. So that is sick, love that. And uh, there's just so much data for nerds in here. I mean, typical M stuff is really, really cool. So the car won't go on because of course we're plugged in and charging. But if you wanna know more about the 5 Series and software in this version of iDrive, actually watch my i5 review. I reviewed it in Portugal on the first drive. I was lucky enough to go to that event. I went through a really deep dive of this entire system. These are just some of the changes for the new M5 sedan and touring. Um, honestly, sitting in here feels like home. There's just something so nice about the interior of 
not only the 5 Series, but when you get the nice leathers, the smooth grain, it's just such high quality. And to think $120,000 in my head, I know it's a lot of money, but to me it sounds like a bargain because Model S plaids were $140,000 a year and a half ago. And now, of course, you can get them much less. But, you know, th this is a lot of car here and you really get a lot of functionality. Battery electric, of course, is the future. We're nearing the end of combustion. We're sort of in that final generation of combustion cars. Why not have a twin turbocharged V8 that revs to over 7,000 RPM with some electric stuff to basically fill in the deficiencies of the combustion engine? When you floor it at low RPM, it can rip the electric motor while the turbos boost up. I love this stuff. I love the engineering. I mean, it, it might be engineering something that's overly complicated and would be easier to just be electric, but I fascinated with the tuning guys that did engineer all of this together and man i love this car i think i'm going to own an m5 touring i just have a feeling that's going to end up in my garage because there's it just pulls the heartstrings and it fits a little bit with everything i love and there is something about the design that still maybe has to grow on me the face is a little bit too robotic i don't know the right way to describe it some of the taillights are not as strong as I would like the design to be. I definitely don't like these wheels, but um, I think in the right spec, that car can really come into its own. Um, and I don't, I actually think the Tourings will hold their value better than the sedans. I know it sounds crazy to say, but uh, look at RS6 values. They're still a lot of money. It's not like they tanked. And I think you're not going to get, of course, you're going to get hurt. It's a BMW. They're going to depreciate. That's just what happens. But I think you're really not going to end up that badly on one of those things. That is such a cool car. And it's so cool that they're producing it. A new crazy machine like this. Anyway, thanks so much for watching this video. Again, we can't drive it. We haven't driven it. And uh, I really, really can't wait to go on the drive, hopefully, or at least experience one at some point for you guys and talk about all of the little nerd integration stuff that really, to me, they need to absolutely nail for this car. I mean, there's... So much to gain, so much to lose. It all comes down to the driving dynamics, the weight, the balance, the handling, the agility. Um, if they did a good job, then it will be amazing. If they did a bad job, it was such a good idea and they came so close. Too early to tell. Don't know. But thanks so much for watching. We'll see you in another one soon. And uh, we got plenty of content coming on this channel. So thanks for watching. Bye-bye.